All right, hello everyone. We've got quite a few folks, so we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you for joining our webinar today. We're so excited to talk to you about additive manufacturing in a panel discussion format featuring Professor Tim Simpson. So first I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Serena and I'm on the marketing team here at Zometry. I will be emceeing the webinar and posing questions to your panelists throughout the webinar. Here are a couple of quick notes before we get started. Please submit your questions throughout the webinar in the question box for your presenters to answer at the end. I'll be monitoring them as they come in, so please feel free to submit them at any time. After the webinar, we'll be sure to send you all a recording for you to rewatch or share with your colleagues. And finally, stick around until the end for a special discount code just for attendees. So now, let me introduce today's special guest, Tim Simpson. Tim is a professor of mechanical engineering design and manufacturing at Penn State University. He serves as the director of the university's additive manufacturing and design graduate program, which is the first program of its kind in the world and co-directs the university's center for innovative materials processing through direct digital deposition, SIMP3D. Beyond the academic world, Tim has helped educate and train more than 700 industry practitioners to use metal additive manufacturing and is a columnist for machine, uh, sorry, Modern Machine Shops Additive Insights. He's also a Barnes Group advisor helping to industrialize additive manufacturing. Next, Thank I want to introduce great. our Thank other, you. of course, welcome. Next, I want to introduce our other presenter, Greg. You've probably seen Greg in our Will It videos, in all of our videos, um, and in past webinars. Um, so you'll probably know that he's the Director of Application Engineering here at Zometry. He's spent over a decade working with engineers on custom manufacturing projects using CNC machining, additive manufacturing, sheet metal, urethane casting, and injection molding. Prior to Zometry, Greg worked in product development with a focus on ruggedized electromechanical systems. So thanks again for tuning in. And don't forget to submit your questions in the webinar question box. And so I'll pass it over to Greg now. Let me make sure my mute's off. Uh, Serena, thank you uh, so, so much. And I, I can't tell you how excited I am to have uh, Tim uh, for this webinar. So uh, just personally, I've seen him several times in speaking events and, and different conference tracks at Rapid and uh, and some other events surrounding additive manufacturing. And uh, he was a recent OK Zoomer uh, uh, guest as well, um, which is uh, another fun thing that Zometry has been doing uh, um, recently. And uh, we've we've collaborated a little bit just via email on some projects going through on additive. Uh, so uh, it's it, he's a great person to geek out on additive manufacturing <laughs> with. Same, same to you, Greg, and, and I'm happy to be a, a, a Zoomer instead of a Boomer, as my kids are starting to refer to me, so thank you for that. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I mean, it, it really, this should be a really fun um, a webinar today, and as Serena mentioned that this is a panel style, so we're going, we're talking some big um, topics on this agenda here, uh, but we're phrasing them more as uh, questions, and we have, uh, we're going to be more image heavy. Uh, on how we're going to answer them. Um, also, uh, we're trying this out. Usually we are, we always are gonna save time for questions at the end, uh, but also if there's something contextual, we're gonna try to bump that into the conversation a little bit uh, as we're covering some of these major topics here. Uh, so just a brief agenda, um, you know, quick introduction of, uh, you know, Zometry, what we do, um, but I'll be very quick because we're gonna uh, uh, focus on uh, these additive topics, uh, such as moving from RP to, uh, true manufacturing, my end use part is going to be additive manufactured. Um, and some of the pers perspectives that Tim has on the industry, um, the approaches uh, that uh, you may think you want to take with additive, but we may change your mind on that uh, based off our experience and moving moving a project into additive manufacturing. And uh, some of those things about design scenarios and cost drivers. Uh, so just to get started here, uh, we make a lot of parts at Zometry, and we are manufacturing agnostic as far as the amount of technologies that we offer. So under additive manufacturing alone, we have seven different unique umbrellas of additive manufacturing technology that make 
uh, you know, photopolymers, thermoset materials, uh, um, thermoplastic materials, urethanes, and metals. Uh, so we have a lot of experience in that. And we're also able to complement uh, that alongside the regular manufacturing portfolio of uh, milling, turning, uh, sheet metal, uh, molding, casting. And it allows us to look at projects with a more agnostic view. Um, the thing about Zometry is we do this in a full supply chain service. So uh, we're not just a single shop. We actually have an interface where you can click, drag, upload uh, your 3D project uh, on our site. Uh, pricing shows up instantly as well as lead times. And you're able to select from those 11 different processes and all those materials underneath each one of those processes uh, to get your pricing lead times updated and further configure your quote. Uh, the beauty of this is we have massive parallel manufacturing capacity because we are partnered with over 3,000 manufacturers domestically and over 4,500 uh, globally uh, to produce work on demand. So uh, not only are we a single storefront for a bunch of uh, different manufacturing technologies, uh, and a lot of those are, are additive manufacturing, uh, but we're also able to distribute that to capable manufacturers that have been vetted and qualified through Zometrix Network to do uh, thousands of projects at once on demand in parallel. So it's, it's really exciting. I'll put, a, I'll put a quick plug in there. Uh, when our classes moved, moved online and we moved out of lab, uh, your cost uh, checker tools, I was having my students submit designs that way since we couldn't actually print them and then look at how does how does pricing change per volume and uh, compare, you know, 3D printing to other technologies? So uh, appreciate you guys making those sort of easily and readily available. Thank you. Yeah, and that's that's actually a, a big use that we see on the site is a quote. Um, a lot of these uh, budgetary quotes, uh, you're putting a file up, just kind of check it, and uh, you're you're you may change um, if you change the geometry, you can see that pricing update. And I think, Tim, you mentioned that you've been also using the strain of SOLIDWORKS because uh, I know we have integrations for SOLIDWORKS and Inventor. Uh, and I, SOLIDWORKS actually, uh, we're, we're just actually elevated to the 3D marketplace. So now if you're running other uh, DSS platforms, I think Atia and other things, you could access the marketplace and get Zometry pricing there. So it's uh, pretty exciting. Uh, first, and also on this slide, I hope I'm not giving anybody seizures. I should have put a good warning here. I, the GIF's a little fast, uh, but, I, uh, but I like it. I, I wanted to start off just kind of framing this out, and then Serena's going to go into some of these questions uh, here. Uh, but when we talk additive manufacturing, there are definitely some uh, paradigm shifts when you're thinking about uh, growing apart versus cutting apart from a larger billet of materials. So 3D printing is that usually a deposition of some sort or a bonding of smaller, part, smaller features, such as a resin or powder, uh, into a larger shape driven by a 3D CAD model. Uh, in that case, the printer is doing a lot of the work, right? So uh, the t a lot of the talent is actually in the quality and repeatability of those machines. Uh, but that also means that the printer is doing its darndest to fit your 3D model. And there's not someone sitting there saying, hey, this edge has to be plus zero minus two and stopping and shaving and stopping and shaving to get those features. So a big paradigm shift in 3D printing is that the printers dictate the tolerances not the print. And when I talk about a print, I'm talking about a 2D technical drawing. Um, also, all printers talk about their accuracy. So X, Y dimensions, as well as Z dimensions, they may have different levels of feature resolution, as well as that accuracy based on standard tolerances, like, you know, plus or minus five thousands. Just understand that it's always driving a part in a net shape. So it can be a very accurate printer, but it's running those global tolerances. And again, it's the printer's best effort at creating that 3D CAD. So whenever I think about a 3D print, I actually think about a net shape, which is uh, something where um, I, may, I, may, I may have in my head that I may need to do some CAD adjustments or something up front, uh, which is the next bullet down, uh, in order to tune the part for that process. Obviously, though, I don't need tooling. I could just upload a part, press go, and get it in a day. I think actually our SLS lead times now are down to one business day and FDM as well on our website. Uh, so just super good as a power uh, as a prototyping snapshot tool. And uh, it's typically a lot faster and less expensive than milling or casting or molding parts, parts through. Um, and when you're looking at production, uh, we're going to go into this a lot deeper, but you're going to be looking at purpose-built design. So 
you're, you're going to build and design it with intention of that part being 3D printed. And we'll go into much more detail um, as we move down the line here. Uh, you know, we're also looking for function because along with that purpose, a lot of times 3D prints, including if you see my GIF here, uh, they're not always the, the glossiest or shiniest of things, but they can be extremely practical and save you costs and time and weight um, on a lot of different applications. And the last thing I wanted to note is that even your know, Zometry running seven different manufacturing technologies that are all additive, they're all considered 3D printers. Um, they all have var varying platforms. Some platforms are up to six six inches. Some are 36 inches. You know, we've seen, and some of these uh, there's some uh, large area um, platforms out there as well that it can just get much much larger. But just understand that depending on the technology chosen, uh, that you may have different platform uh, size limitations and it's something to be mindful of. And we have wonderful guides on that. Uh, but keep that in mind because this applies to literally everything uh, that we're talking about today. Oh, Serena, you got mute. You're muted right now. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah. So, Greg, first question for you: Can you elaborate more on that? How does 3D printing help product development? Yeah, absolutely. So, I have a couple examples uh, that I want to talk through um, on how I see uh, additive manufacturing used in kind of this uh, uh, design iteration or rapid prototyping phase. Um, and I'm keeping this pretty short because, again, most of us know that you can upload a file, get something really quick, and it's pretty cheap to do. Um, I thought this example uh, was uh, great. Uh, this is a company called Early Human. Uh, they were working on an archery training uh, piece that essentially would hook right onto your bow. And as you're pulling back, if you're putting any extra force on it, it will actually wiggle and show you that you're actually deflecting the bow in, in a, a direction that the air won't go straight in. Uh, and these are their SLS and HP Multijet Fusion prototypes as they are working on different designs for snap and flex uh, and other features. But it kind of shows you this, this almost shotgun approach that you can do with design iterations where you can try a lot of small variations either as one purchase or rapid, uh, rapid fire in a row where you're, where you're doing a variation, checking something, doing a little bit of a CAD adjustment, running that variation again. Um, in this case, uh, because this part is fairly small, it's fairly uh, you know thin and uniform. A lot of these powder bed processes like SLS tend to be the cheapest way of, of making these parts. But you can see here, sometimes the prototyping effort it takes a lot of iterations to run, and this is where three D printing is just very strong. But in this case, they when they want to make one part and you have one design done and you need to make thousands of it, uh, their ultimate goal is injection mold. So this was really in that uh, product development stage uh, where it was most powerful. Uh, the other one is that looks like prototype, right? Looks in this case, it looks and feels like uh, another super common example of when I'm using additive manufacturing in that engineering floor uh, um, uh, environment. And uh, this is actually a product I was on Kickstarter called Narbox, uh, and uh, they were essentially doing kind of media storage and editing uh, for GoPros and other uh, you know other uh, mobile like high high activity cameras, if you will. And uh, they were looking for kind of a feel of this. And uh, they used a process called Polyjet, which is a photopolymer process that kind of works like an inkjet where it puts little micro droplets of resin down. And it's actually able to mix different properties of resins together in small, almost like a micro matrix. Uh, and by doing that, you can give a rigid body with a rubber-like outer in one print on one part. Uh, so um this is a great example of a rapid prototype the life of this part is really um really probably several days or a few trade shows in uh for how it'll be used um it's going to give them a feel of something that they're ultimately again going to move into injection mold with but it helps them get that rapid prototype in a couple days uh to uh to validate their design uh, accurately uh for the process so it's a it's another example of something where my goal is another manufacturing process, uh, but 3D printing, additive manufacturing is still extremely important in making sure that when I commit to that tool, I have it right. Um, so it's a little bit different in this case, like, you know, I call this more of that RP rapid prototype, uh, where a lot of times we talk about additive manufacturing, especially with Tim, what do you do? It's much more of a, you know, end use real deal. 
Thank you, Greg. Now, mm -hmm. here's a question for Tim. Additive, mm -hmm. as an industry, where are we at with additive manufacturing? Cool. I think um, you know part of what's uh, what's telling here is that uh, you know we we've sort of had a name change, right? So uh, seven eight years ago, you know instead of calling it 3D printing, uh, ASTM, uh, one of the governing bodies in terms of terminology related to additive, uh, calls it uh, said, hey, let's call it additive manufacturing. Recognize that we are adding material, uh, as Greg said, we're growing apart, not sculpting it or subtracting, and we are manufacturing. We are creating end-use parts, not just prototypes anymore. Uh, but I think what we've seen in the companies that we worked with, certainly at Penn State and the companies that we engaged through uh, through the Barnes Group, uh, you know, there there requires a big mind shift here. And I think first and foremost, uh, you know, how are you going to differentiate yourself? Anybody can buy a machine, sort of learn how to operate it, put powder in it, make parts, et cetera. Uh, so really, learning how to design for additive and take advantage of its of its capabilities is really unique. And that's really that second bullet there is the, the new freedoms that we have with layer-based manufacturing, adding layer by layer by layer, uh, gives you some new capabilities, some new freedoms, both on the design and the material side. So you may be able to actually consider using materials that previously were too expensive or whatnot uh, because of that, or maybe they were too difficult to machine. You know, some of the titanium and inconels uh, or nickel-based super alloys that folks are using are important. Uh, but being able to get to that next level, it's not just the machines, right? You got to invest in the people. I'm biased, you know, a big key piece of this is the design side, you know, how do you design parts for AM? That's really what we're going to dig into here in a bit. And of course, the software that's out there. I mean, again, the plugin from uh, from Zometry on, on costing is great. Uh, some of the lattice design software that's out there, topology optimization, generative tools that we'll talk a little bit about. Those are key. And I think that's where a lot of people struggle is how do you put those together with this new mindset? And really it is a new way of, of capturing value and or you know, in many cases, maybe even thinking entirely differently about the business case there. So slide on the right here is an oil and gas component we worked on uh, six, seven years ago now. Traditionally it was made uh, uh, sort of uh, casting and then uh, machining inside. There are sort of these serpentine channels that as you spin this component, centrifugal force pumps fluid up or down they said hey could we you know use additive to lightweight this and you know because the only real features are are sort of the channels you know in the shell this thing of course is subjected to 10,000 psi as it's down hole um you know that's really difficult as you can imagine to machine these holes inside your gun drilling backfilling holes etc cetera, etc cetera. so hey could you use additive we said oh let's check out some lattices so you can sort of see that that lattice goes all the way through it reduced the weight by about 40%, but more importantly, what it so it kept the same functionality, reduced the weight by 40%, but more importantly, what it enabled was them to use a, a, a newer, higher grade material that essentially allowed for longer downhole life, some aftermarket reuse that completely changed the economics around this. And so by leveraging the design uh, to enable some material substitutions that you were not able to consider previously, because Again, from a subtractive, you're removing material and wasting it, right? So you got to buy it all. But with additive, you're only paying sort of for what you use and what you need in the part there. And so this, I think, is a great example, sort of the shift in mindset that has to come along with additive in order to get, um, you know, in order to really be able to use it. Of course, we always get the get the situation, you know, are my putts strong enough? Uh, I love uh, showing this example. Uh, my colleague, Ted Reutzel, worked closely with the Navy on this one, probably the most stressful 15, 18 months of his life, trying to figure out, you know, how are we going to additively manufacture this out of titanium? Uh, it's the first flight critical component that uh, the Navy flew on uh, on one of their aircraft. The V-22 Osprey uh, continues to, to fly and operate, as I understand uh, to this day, obviously it's fully censored uh, and service, you know, and what I'm holding up and what you see in the background there, the nice shiny parts, that often come with additive are only after heat treating and machining and finishing and bead blasting, et cetera. The raw part literally off the machine there as built is shown in the foreground. And part of the design, you know, in this case, what we're trying to do is replicate that part, right? This is, this is not that fancy. It hasn't been optimized or anything like that. We want a direct comparison of performance. You know, this is a critical component. So how does that compare? And so from a design perspective, you're thinking about, all right, well, what's the best build orientation? 
Where do I put support structures to uh, support overhangs that we'll, we'll get into in a little bit? You know, those are some key decisions. And uh, unfortunately, I can say that yes, as long as you know, uh, A, what you're doing, how to make it, but all the heat treatment post-processing, then yeah, we are seeing that parts are strong enough and actually in some cases stronger uh, than the traditionally made parts. So that's a great thing. Of course, this doesn't you know weigh any less. It doesn't perform any differently. And, and the additive part costs quite a bit more than the traditionally made one, but you can attack that with design as well. And we'll get you some of those examples in just a little bit. So yeah. next, next slide there, if you would, uh, Serena. Yeah, uh, uh, I was actually gonna say, just going back to this yeah. real quick, uh, the, this is the this is the idea of net talking about net shape in itself. Like this is a way of using a very premium material and essentially making a a blink that is prepared for that post processing. And we'll, we'll go further than that, but that's a you know really good example, especially because you see the before and after of that using metal yeah. additive. Yeah, and here's an, here's another example, of sort of this baseline. I think this is where a lot of companies are right now, and it's also where a lot of companies stumble. They want to take the traditionally made part, you know, cast machine forged, and they want to turn around and make it out of additive, right? And they want to say, okay, you know, I want an apples to apples comparison. That was the, you know, the forged machine part compared to the additive part, uh, you know, in terms of cost, in terms of quality, surface roughness. Uh, and so creating a baseline with AM is important. And I think as we'll see and talk about, you know, it's managing expectations uh, you know, your boss goes out and reads, you know, the latest greatest article on all the, the, the cost time that additive is going to save him or her. And then you, you're tasked to basically repeat what you've already done. You know, you're, you're not going to get the benefits that you hope. So this was a case with some heat exchangers. Uh, again, when we when we do sort of work with companies, it's, uh, you know, if they have to just make a part, go to Zometry, go to, you know, many of the other AM service bureaus out there. We want to work with them and iterate. Part of our lesson or uh, you know mission as a university is to sort of share the knowledge with them. So we'll we'll only do the the, the baseline if you let us do the redesign and and continue with you as well or some testing. In this case, the additively manufactured heat exchanger was 15% more efficient, but you had twice the pressure drop, and so that high delta P is not a good thing. So even though the better efficiency is good, you know you're losing the pressure, you're losing the flow through this, and that has detrimental effects. But in this case we're making the part with additive, we're not really designing the part for additive yet. And so there are ways of now improving that efficiency and taking advantage, for instance, of the surface roughness uh, to improve heat transfer without, uh, without these losses. And you're seeing a lot of examples in heat exchangers, uh, heat conduction, heat pipe, those sorts of things now, which is a, a sort of a new hot area for, uh, again, the additive, the freedoms that you have with additive. Yeah, and, and you were noting that the pressure drop was due to the fact that you have an inherently rough surface finish uh, on as grown parts and it you know it's going to be very very difficult to go inside essentially this, these flow areas where um where you really need the the something smooth to move, to move through and transfer heat absolutely so uh the other big thing i mean now with with additive uh you know we're used to humans designing parts but i think we have an opportunity you can see the two images here computer technology so we've had generative design or sorry We've had, we've called it topology optimization. Now we have generative design tools, I think is the broader class of, of uh, tools and software where the computer is now helping you generate the geometry. So uh, I think historically topology optimization has been more a subtractive uh, approach, but uh, certainly there are other formulations generated as generative is trying to look at how do we grow geometries. And, and what's interesting here is because of the complexities around design, uh, and the features, it's hard to create all of that in your CAD environment. And so in some cases, our role as designer shift, where we just decide, bleh, we specify sort of what's what's shown on the uh, on the right half of the screen. Basically, here's the volume in which I can put material. You know, I need a hole here and, a, and another surface here. There, those are the gray, basically don't put material there. And then the red, green, uh, blue, that's where I, you know, in this case, this is, um, an upright for the formula race car that students design, the frame connects to it. So at three points, you got the brake calipers, these apply loads to it and you simulate, basically give it a bunch of different loading conditions. Uh, and eventually uh, it'll inspire new designs. And in some cases actually create a fi finished geometry for you uh, like the one shown on the left there. And so there's some pretty sweet tools now, uh, Paramatters, Altair, uh, Inspire, even uh, within Fusion 360, within Autodesk has some tools as well. So, so these are pretty new, and and I think certainly the um, 
certainly the you know the undergrads and grad students coming out of college you know they'll they'll grab software and play around with this easily it's probably probably some of the more senior engineers are a bit more reticent on using these things but nonetheless these help you now lightweight components and really start to take advantage of the freedoms that additive can provide again these tools have been around for 30 plus years but sort of the output has been tough to manufacture until you know now that we really have additive technology so it's a great combination as i said of of the the hardware uh, the making and the software for optimizing coming together. But, you know, despite that, I think there is a challenge. You know, we still need the, the designer in the loop. So that the geometry I showed on the previous, this is actually what it looks like when it's built in a, in a vertical orientation. So, so I actually have the, the finished part here. Remember to grab that on my office yesterday. Uh, so this is the actual part uh, when it's said and done that was optimized. But you can see in that image there, all of the supports that are underneath are actually shown in red and yellow in that other image. And this is inherent, particularly when you're doing metal uh, parts on, a, it's called powder bed fusion. We'll show you in a video a little bit with a laser. The heating, cooling, heating, cooling that goes on creates uh, residual stresses in the part that want it to basically, you know, distort and curl up, sort of like a potato chip, right? And so you're putting things down in such thin layers that if you are not anchoring your parts to the build plate, and things to sort out the next time the recoder comes across you know smacks and hits your geometry you know you're in trouble there so uh you need to be able to accommodate that and i think design is good for both uh both innovation and mitigation of these uh these limitations and that's something again that we promote a lot with uh within companies and the, the barnes group and others that we interact with <clears throat> fascinating thanks for that background tim so given these considerations and limitations, how do companies get started with additive manufacturing? Great. Um, so yeah, if you go to the next slide, we sort of see three, three use cases that have sort of started to emerge. And these are both within, we were seeing it within SIMP3D. Uh, we see it a lot as well with, uh, with companies when we go in and do workshops. I love you know, this slide from uh, uh, friends of ours at Pratt & Whitney, Bill Brindley uh, and, and Jesse Boyer, their additive manufacturing fellow. You know, they put this slide up at one of, we have used to host technology exchanges at Penn State. And I love this because it sort of shows, okay, you know, here's phase one, right? We're gonna make as is exactly what we talked about. We want a baseline. Essentially, it is a direct substitution of a current part. Uh, if you advance to the next uh, next image there, phase 1B then uh, is actually looking at, and so we call that, a, you know, replicating with additive manufacturing. Uh, if you go to a phase 1B where we're designing for producibility, you're now making uh, modifications to overcome some of the limitations in, uh, you know, in the process, in this case for metals. Uh, and so this is what we refer to as sort of an adapt for AM uh, yeah. sort of situation, sort of that second phase where you're now, I mean, it's similar to when we design for manufacturing, right? There's a step in there where we adapt our, our part to be machined or cast or forged. We do that with AM as well. And then finally, the third one, if you have an opportunity to sort of clean sheet there, uh, you can now, as Pratt says, really design for competitive advantage where you optimize for weight, cost, performance, light weighting, you know, uh, frequency response, uh, thermal efficiency, sort of you name it. And it's that third stage is uh, the optimize for AM, sort of this replicate, adapt, and optimize. Or when I, when I talk about this often, it's sort of this crawl, walk, run approach to additive. You sort of got to, you know, start there with, with, you know, repeating or replicating what you have before you sort of adapt and walk. And then eventually you want to get to the run. I think part of the biggest challenge, uh, I've actually uh, created a, you know, a whole course with ASME on this. And we talk about some of the biggest challenges there is, you know, the engineers, particularly the students coming out of college now, they want to go straight to phase three, right? They want to they want to optimize and show you how awesome they are with the latest tools. Guess what? You know, it's the the senior leaders and managers that are still, you know, making the making the investment decisions and how do you help them overcome their risk uh, and the uncertainties associated with additive. And so you have to be careful about managing expectations at each of these steps, you know, because they do have uh, some important implications. And so uh, I think if you hop to the next slide, there we we sort of hit on those. But, oh, I wanted to note on this. Yeah, I want to note on this by the way, like. A lot of times, like, so files will be uploaded to Zometry and they'll be uh, looking to do metal additive. And sometimes it is that exploratory run. So uh, a lot of times this this phase 1A to phase 1B here is pretty common. Something we see a lot, especially if you need like a onesie, twosie of something where you're just, you're just testing the grounds. 
And so like our, our, our DFM team, like our additive experts and application engineers may come here and say, hey, you know, could you put a little gusset here so it, so this part grows naturally and we'll, we'll, help, we'll help you consider what orientation we'd see this build in and some DFM tips. Uh, but definitely when you're moving to this, there's so much purpose, you know, and, and intuition that we don't see us from the manufacturability side. And that really is that engineering effort. So it's kind of like a crawl, then walk, then think. And then we're running, you know, so like there's there's like a there's that gap here, the the valley uh, here. Absolutely. Yep. So uh, as I go through these stages, I think, um, you know, sort of the, the the link that I showed you, the heat exchanger, this, you know, baselining your part, making comparisons, sort of this replicate. I, I think mainly the real main advantage that we've seen is is time. You know, it gives you speed. Right. And so we've done a lot of work, particularly you know, the, the, the iterations that Greg talked about before. We've worked with companies where, hey, we wanna create, you know, functional prototypes. You know, it takes two weeks now, let's do it, you know, with 3D printing instead. I've seen Siemens with some of their, uh, their gas turbine blades. They're, they're going from like two years down to two months on, yeah. on some of their iteration cycles because of this. So there are some huge opportunities there. Uh, of course, you gotta be careful, costs are gonna go up, you know, quality, Hopefully it's the same, uh, uh, but you certainly have to do some post-processing to get there and sort of the, the acceptance, uh, you know, you've got to overcome just people's inherent limitations and thinking. You get over that hurdle, you can get to the adapt stage like uh, the oil and gas component. Hey, it's the same, you know, the sort of the core functionality is the same, but let me just add some light lattices to lightweight it a bit or, uh, you know, reduce the print time. So here now, again, time is, uh, of an advantage you've got speed but you can also make it more viable your costs are coming down because you're using less material or using a material more effectively uh, again you got to be careful with quality uh, and acceptance and those sorts of things making sure you're doing the, the right post processing and thermal treatments at the end on the metal side and then finally on the last one there with the optimize uh, case hopefully this is where every everything goes well right you're fast uh, you're cheaper you're better performing uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, you're getting getting more and more acceptance, building up confidence among, uh, you know, the senior engineers and managers. Uh, de you know, really, it's all about de-risking, right? This is still a relatively new process. We've had, you know, casting has been around 5,000 years, right? CNC machining is, you know, 70 plus years. You know, additive 30, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's still pretty small. So we still got a lot of a lot of data, not a knowledge, and a lot of things that are going to help us with this acceptance. So I think that's a good, um, you know, a good good thing to keep in mind. Great. Um, and before we get to this next question, I just want to remind everyone that we do have a live Q and A at the end. Uh, we're reserving about 15 minutes, so keep the questions rolling in. So, Tim, what are some design scenarios we can talk through? What are the crucial things designers need to know to move ahead with additive manufacturing? Great, well, I think, you know, one of the key things here uh, is really understanding the process. And so this was one of uh, an image here, if you wanna run that, Greg. Um, you know, we've done some work. Uh, we've been a partner with America Makes uh, since the very uh, early stages, the beginnings there. Uh, actually, I was fortunate uh, to do an academy, a, a sort of a hands-on workshop with the Air Force Research Lab um, uh, with the Lannerman Group several years ago uh, and 3D Systems. This was one of the, the parts that we were building during that time. And I love seeing this because it's great. You can sort of see, watch how the laser bounces around. You know, each layer, the laser's going in a different direction. Uh, that's, you know, sort of some of the process parameters that are key, the spot size, the speed, uh, you know, the layer thickness, every one of those uh, varies by machine, varies by material, and, and those are some of the key process parameters, if you will, that uh, will dictate the quality and performance of your part when it's said and done. So, uh, again, it's like, you know, trying to teach students about, you know, machining and casting, you know. It, you can learn about it in books and, and on video, but until you actually see it in action uh, and really get a hand on it, um, you know, it's something else. And, and granted, you know, I think this part uh, was a relatively short build. We've had builds that that are gone, you know, 70, 80, 100 hours long. You know, you only need to three, see three, four or five layers and you sort of get the gist of it. But but nonetheless, you know, it is a very dynamic process. You see all this sort of sparks and powder that's flying around there. There's been some phenomenal work. Uh, Wayne King and his team at Lawrence Livermore, for instance, are really, you know, modeling and simulating that. I've seen it uh, elsewhere as well. 
you know, you've got little particles that are coming up, coming down, the cross flow of the gas. It's a it's a pretty pro complex process there. You've got the recoder blade going back and forth that can knock it. You know, there's a lot of knobs and dials to turn. And and we still, you know, the, these metal processes have been around, you know, 10, 15 years or more. But I'd say we're still really trying to understand the physics of everything's going on there so we can truly optimize the process parameters for, you know, this material on this machine and, and this part. So, uh, yeah. so I think part of what, oh, Greg, go ahead. I, I was going to say, you, you just mentioned on this and we were talking about uh, this. I, I, there's a question that just came in. Uh, what's the importance of using process simulation software? And I thought that'd be, while we're showing the, while we're showing the process, I, I did want to mention, like, I always explain DMLS as a battle. Like it is a, is a battle of uh, metal versus build plate, like your part versus the build plate uh, going on in there. Because when I'm running something like uh, laser powder bed fusion in a, in a plastic platform, like selective laser centering, uh, I'm warming everything up and everything is, is hanging out at like, you know, about 120, 140 Celsius, give or take, whatever, which, depending on the material I have. And so I just got to barely nudge it in order for it to melt its neighbors and melt underneath, hit its laid underneath, and that giving you that Z dimension for 3D. And uh, it's very controlled. And now if I do a degree Celsius up or down, I'll see I'll see results that I don't like, but uh, um, it is very it's still a very controlled environment. Where in metal, it's essentially room temperature. Like there's some caveats and build plates and stuff, but it's essentially room temper temperature. And I'm strong arm welding with a laser, you know, full power into a that material into a build plate. So all these are welded to a build plate and then welding up on top. So these stresses just really fight each other. So even that on that video there, that the pattern in which it wasn't scanning the entire cross section like a TV, you know, old school TV would, would. it's t taking little sections. All these little pieces of tidbits are like, you know, sometimes you'll see a hex hexagonal profile, you know, one, two, three, four, is to fight the stress that's occurring every single layer. Because as Tim said, one little deflection, my recoder goes across, drags my build or causes a defect in the build. And if your build falls, sometimes it stops it, but if your build, build falls through, you open up the chamber and you're like, scrap. You know, there's no exactly. such thing as half part. Uh, in that yeah, and I, and I think uh, to the, you know, to the questioner, I think what we're seeing, particularly the last five, six years now, is that uh, uh, this process simulation software that's out there and available is helping you uh, identify these and, uh, you know, potentially redesign your part before you spend tens of thousands of dollars and, and get a failure. So we're actually fortunate. The, um, my colleague, Pan McAlaris, who had done a lot of a lot of welding research, you're right. A lot of people model this as a welding process. It's a very small scale with very thin layers. He actually customized some of his uh, uh, welding code, adapted it first for directed energy deposition and then powder bed fusion spun that out and that actually is now uh autodesk's uh you know netfab ultimate the simulation capability that uh, was validated in the lab so it's pretty cool that we've been in the game and able to actually spin out technology that's now being used certainly you've got ansys uh and 3d sim from brent stucker you've got so um, siemens has capabilities i mean there's 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 at least a half a dozen if not more packages and i think these are these are now some of those software tools I was talking about before, particularly in metals that are, it, you need to add them in the loop. You need to do some simulation. Uh, I'd say we're still a bit a ways from sort of being very accurate at predicting those, but at least it shows you sort of trends and where the potential hotspots are. So I have a, I have a build, one of the examples, uh, sadly, I, it failed almost uh, seven times before we got it right. Uh, we put it in software uh, with NetFab, uh, ultimate there and simulated it and you know lo and behold it, it didn't get exactly right but it said yep here's the area we're going to have concerns and lo and behold that's where it was and I wish I had done that you know six build failures before so uh, yeah. I would strongly encourage you to use and check out some of those tools and they're becoming much more readily available now uh, and offer a lot of neat capabilities so and, and just All like right. topology optimization, uh, a lot of this has to do with that access to software. So Autodesk has, uh, honestly, I'll give them kudos. Like they've been uh, um, kind of running a really nice suite on uh, the uh, some of the optimizations that you get through Fusion, as well as uh, NetFab, I believe is Autodesk product. Uh, and they just did a release, a new NetFab yep. release like a couple of days ago. Um, and yep. uh, But there's, there's some really good software that essentially does that digital twin 
you know, it simulates the build in a digital setting. Uh, it figures out what's going to go wrong. And uh, ultimately, the feedback loop that you hope that happens is there's some level of pre-deformation or uh, beefing up of a support structure uh, for a part that, you know, straight a straight feature that may want to do this when it's, you know, being being grown and uh, certain, um, you know, certain aspects of it. But I, I do think that software still needs a lot of maturity. It's getting there and everybody knows what you need to do, but getting it right so that when I, you know, take my geometry and I say, go print it, uh, what comes out is exactly that. Uh, it's, you know, a lot, there's still that upfront risk and there's still some tuning usually, especially when you're looking for additive production, you're going to be tuning that. Um, it's a good segue though uh, on you know our design guide and that sort of thing because at least you can start aiming for it right you at least you can start understanding the, the general principles in that shape um, and and what to expect on your first run um, so we have some really good uh, tips on the design guide I don't yeah, I wanna, to... yeah no I want to and and again hats off to, to Zometry for being out there early on this I think you guys were publishing some of these before some of the OEMs were releasing these publicly so uh, we were joking the other day. I mean, I've been using this, the earlier versions of this for almost five or six years now as sort of show them in presentations. Cause this is, you know, these are the sort of questions that at, at a first, first pass, you know, Hey, how big can I make it? What sort of layers, you know, what are my minimum feature sizes? You know, what sort of tolerances can I hold, right? Designers need to know these things. And so if nothing else, you know, you may not have the, the latest, greatest simulation or software tools, but at least, you know, Go to the guidelines and, and look and, and take a look at these. And I'd say, uh, you know, Zometry's got a, a nice set of these, but the other manufacturers, the OEMs, are, are now realizing how important these are and are sharing that information as well. So, so these are key uh, as part of that. If you want to go to the next slide, yeah. uh, you know, I think one of the challenges here is those guides, though, are really geared at trying to help you avoid failures, right? And how do you? What are the limitations and or where are the challenges? So. You know, here's three of many examples. You know, the rough surfaces, you're melting powder particles with metal, you don't get a nice smooth surface. You know, you saw earlier sort of the finished, the as built versus the finished part, right? How do you do that? Thin walls can create issues and also depending on the orientation with respect to the recoder blade. Thick sections, there's a titanium part that uh, cracked halfway through the build, the residual stresses. Guess what? The same challenges you run into with welding or, you know, many of the same challenges you're going to run into here. And if a, you know, it was sort of a good rule of thumb is if it's if the material is easy to weld, then it then it's probably going to do pretty well with within a you know within a laser based process. Uh, everybody's sort of working against that or pushing pushing that more, but but that's sort of an initial rule of thumb. And when we talk about design for additive DFAM here, these are really sort of the restrictive aspects of DFAM, right? We'll talk about some of the opportunistic in a minute, but uh, if you want to click, there's a, I think one more picture here on this slide. Um, you know, this is a great picture for Hala Rao at uh, University of Lincoln, uh, Nebraska Lincoln. You know, this is a great shot. He had uh, eight or nine components, all the same, all on one build that, you know, every one of them had sort of a different, <laughs> different failure on it, unfortunately. Of course, this doesn't bode well for us as additive, but I think, I think <laughs> it's important to, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta understand the realities, right? The hope, the hype is just so big. People appreciate hearing the realities and seeing that. And so, you know, how do you design and use simulation and guidelines to avoid the crashes, the cracking, the warping, you know, the balling and everything? You know, some of these are at the, at the process parameter level uh, and really doing that. But some of these are also just good design that becomes very easy to avoid, you know, going forward on that. So there are some challenges still. I think we got a much better handle on it now uh, than we did certainly five years ago. Uh, but there's still a lot of questions and unknowns out there. So, all right. One of those, of course, you know, support structures. We've seen it. We've talked about it. Again, you know, the upright here, uh, you know, you saw the supports underneath it. Unfortunately, you've got 21st century technology, laser technology making this. And then uh, as Corey Dickman, one of my engineers said, you go caveman on it, throw it in a vise and, you know, hack, cut, grind. Uh, you know, remove the support structures, particularly if you're only doing one or two, right? So, so how are you then designing parts to make them easy to post process? So right now, it's sort of a necessary evil. And I would say this is probably one of the biggest challenges you're going to run into when you're sort of in that replicator adapt phase is that the geometry that you have designed has not been designed for additive. And so if you're just going to try and make that in with additive, a one-to-one, -one, you are going to spend a lot of time post-processing it and that's going to kill it and i think uh, greg your example here is a 
you know, a great example about how to use design to, to overcome that. Yeah, absolutely. And this, uh, this one had a little bit of a challenge uh, to, uh, it was a little bit of a challenge test. We actually made this design when we were, when we were launching SLA as kind of a test design and uh, for this, uh, where I actually have pockets on the reverse side and I have an O-ring groove in the middle here. Um, and these are just some like tidbits to know as well. Like because I had pockets on this side, um, I couldn't lay this flat on a plate uh, because those pockets lifted and essentially had what we call an overhang. And if I uh, put support structure in there, it would be almost like a blanket of supporting material that would be extremely difficult to remove. So to be more finessed, uh, this part was angled, uh, angled up at a 45. And one of the things about uh, when you're growing these DMLS parts, and uh, this is ad most additive processes do require some support structure, but especially DMLS, um, carbon DLS, and stereolithography all kind of uh, work with these rules where I want to try to grow as much as what I call natural as possible, which means I'm not supporting it. So all these faces here are the natural finish. Uh, by holding this at a 45 degree, I'm able to grow. Um, uh, this uh, center shaft area um, naturally. And even by angling with this tip up, uh, these are now 45 degree off of this. And I'm able to grow these features as well without uh, without support structure. So support structure seems massive here, but actually what it's touching on the part is highly minimized uh, compared to if I had this oriented in, a, in another way. Um, and if I was working through optimization, I may even ask myself, like, why do I even need the lightweights here? Like, could I just remove material? Can there just be a through hole? Like, you know, uh, what can I make it more like a spider web down here? And there's some some other things that you could start to um, explore. Like, why do I need this cut out here? Could I just make this a V shape uh, to to get the clamp force uh, um, as you're designing this? But like I said, it's a mixture of a challenge part and it does show some good uh, supporting structure here uh, on the part. Good. Yeah, um, I think I think. Oh, go ahead. Oh, oh yeah. I was just gonna go because there's actually a question, um, a question here, which is how easy is it to do secondary operations? And I was holding on. It was actually our first question, but we had this slide on this. Um, when I'm designing for something where I know I'm gonna post machine the the part, uh, it's, and I know we're focusing a lot on metals, but that's because these are probably the most sensitive uh, platforms for this type of uh, um, this type of post processing. Uh, a lot of times I have to begin with the end in mind. So um, this example that we have here is, uh, is are parts that honestly the where these are functional are, are the finned areas, like this nice organic naturally grown part. And in fact, these are grown essentially without supports. They were actually, if you flip these upside down, this was the base here. And I believe these grew naturally. They may have had a little thin layer of support structure, but they had, because they had this angle, they were actually they actually grew really well. So what's the rest of this uh, shaft down here? It's to hold it. Uh, so when you have these beautiful, delicate structures, if you're going to do some post-machine or post-milling, you actually need to hold it somehow with a work holding solution. And so this example here is a really good example where uh, they just ex essentially extended an inch of uh, shaft to this so it could be uh, chucked up and run on a, on a mill or a lathe uh, for some finishing approaches. Um, I also want to show this uh, this because there's bad ways of doing this too like this is a you know uh you know a very scolded hand on a stove um in design uh but this was a inconel part uh 3d uh, printed in metal and you can see here when you machine in metal actually this stuff machines like billet it, it, it machines like the metallurgic properties that you're used to when you're a, a traditional machinist but we have to be mindful of is that battle that it's had uh and the stresses that have built up on it as it's being built uh, even with, if it's de-stressed and annealed, there may be very small levels of warping on these parts. And so as an engineer, I may be putting tolerances on my part that I'm used to from a CNC level where I could you know, say this center hole is the center of everything, reference everything off this center hole, which was exactly the case in this. The machinists put this up on their fifth axis machine. Um, they found that center hole, started making the center, uh, they indicated off the base, and then they said run. And the machine went and turned where it thought everything would be. But you can see here that every hole just kind of subsequently got a little bit off uh, on these sides. Uh, so when you're when you're thinking about additive, understand that there may be a little wiggle, which doesn't mean the part's wrong, but it doesn't mean you may need to tolerance it differently where uh, every circle should be concentric to the pillar around it, the boss around it, essentially, and make those the, make those statements respect to each other. And if you do that, 
I could guarantee you the hole is going to be in the center of the channel. So if you um, if you uh, if you do tolerance those correctly, you're going to have a much much better time if you do require things like porting or post processing, like indicate per hole and per feature. Cool. So I think you know it, it's easy. We've talked about a lot on the restrictive side. You know there is opportunities uh, abound with additive manufacturing, and so sort of that's the the counter uh, weight, if you will, and we talk, we refer to that sort of as opportunistic design for AM, you know, where you're achieving the benefits. And really sort of this trade-off uh, between restrictive and opportunistic sort of comes down on, uh, you know, where, how much freedom do you have? And so the topology optimization, one of the examples that, that Greg has shown, certainly lattice structures as well there, uh, the ability to create them at, at a fine scale, I showed you the big one. We're seeing that as well a lot in the medical industry with implants being able to do uh, better fixation. Conformal cooling, uh, something we've talked about. This is actually a laser head uh, on one of our DED, directed energy deposition systems that we made with powder bed fusion. Uh, and our designer, Corey Dickman, basically it's three parts that now is one with an internal channel to help cool the uh, that surface uh, as the laser and uh, is passing through it. And of course, uh, the last example there, uh, you know, part consolidation you know, GE leap nozzle, right? You got to say or mention mm -hmm. that at some point in an additive talk, this is our version. Uh, this is uh, with the Navy very early on, John Schmezel and his team, 17 parts that's now printed as a single piece, right? So you're saving weight, you're saving, uh, uh, you know, you're reducing leak points and those sorts of things. So, and, and of course, saving on assembly time. So some great opportunities there if you can really take advantage of additive. The other one, uh, last example here I wanted to give uh, is the opportunity now you know, with additive, the economics change and you almost get to what we call sort of the economies of one, right? The usual economies of scale, you know, spend a lot of money on a tool and reproduce it uh, is one thing. But this is leading to new opportunities for startups like Vortec Watch here. Uh, RT Custer was an alum of ours. They, uh, he and his friend basically take uh, old pocket watches and refurbish them. And then they custom print 3D uh, cases, you know, leather strap, et cetera. And so we connect, we actually did some work with them. Uh, through America Makes grant uh, that we had through uh, for small mid-sized companies, uh, demonstration projects, uh, did some redesign, connected them with Imperial Machine and Tool. And now you can see basically whenever, you know, RT and his team need to make an order, Imperial cranks out, you know, here's the 10 for this week, here's the, you know, you count those, here's the 100 or so for uh, for the coming week based on orders. You know, they can be all different different sizes as well. I think these are, uh, you can sort of see on that front plate in the middle, you see a bunch of small small watches for uh, for one size women's version and then slightly larger for the men. So you don't have tooling. And so being able to print on demand when you need it, you know, now with additive is becoming much more viable. And it's great seeing startups, you know, like uh, like Vortec and others that are doing it. And, you know, next slide there, I love, Love my Vortec watch, you know, and here's just some of the examples, the ability now to customize your watch case, your, you know, Invisalign braces is all done with tooling, you know, ear implants, you know, I think I think one of the real killer apps is, is gonna be with customization for the user, for the individual and additives economics and the freedoms that come with design is, uh, is really what's gonna enable that and I think become game changing. And, and I think that's a big part of why it's here to stay. And just a, just a reminder here, keep the questions coming. And by the way, I've, I've seen local motor says mass configuration. I've seen others say mass customization. Because so customization is like infinite possibilities. Local motors is like, instead of eight, let's give you 80. You know, like it's, it's uh, you know, it's uh, using additive, but, you know, kind of it, you know, kind of giving you the ability to pick and choose the features, but they're still manufacturable for the process without a lot of discovery. Well, back, back to my earlier point, I mean, I think a lot of this is it, it cha you know, our usual economics around, okay, I'm going to do injection molding, it's going to cost me 100,000 for this tool, therefore I better make, you know, 100,000 of them. With additive now, you can say, okay, well, I can now make a business case for, for 10,000 or 5,000 or 1,000 in some cases. And so it really, again, a lot of companies aren't used to thinking that way and mass, you know, we're so, mass production is so ingrained in our psyche that that I think additive really disrupts that. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and just relevant, you know, COVID-19 response, uh, face shields and other things, you name it, like every every call to arms you could possibly imagine happened and uh, additive really shined that ability to do localized movements uh, and uh, just uh, honestly, 
serve almost immediately to the need, which was just absolutely. Extreme. I think we've seen the response from company. You know, the the the, the pandemic has certainly exposed a lot of uh, challenges and issues in the supply chain. Uh, it's been great that you guys have stayed open for that. I know we've sent sent some parts and quotes and yeah. things your way because you you know you can get in there and make them for us. So I'm uh, much appreciated. And I think I think that's going to continue to stay as well. The the need for you know, domestic local manufacturing and local supply chains to address these needs as things change so uh, so drastically. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I did want to, we're going to, we're coming to the questions uh, section here, um, but just want to reiterate, you know, we do a lot and what's really cool is we're talking with experience as manufacturers. So we have, we, yes, we're additive manufacturers, but we also put this in the context of other, you know, other technologies, because sometimes it just makes sense to use one technology over the other. Uh, but uh, if you are working with intent in mind, it can be extremely powerful uh, as a tool. Um, if you ever have any questions, uh, you know, at Zometry, uh, we are, there's many ways to contact us. We got the chat bubble in our website. Um, you could call us uh, and, and talk to a representative. He gets you in touch with the engineer. Uh, even if you're quoting, you have actually a uh, point of contact that's dedicated to you. So you'll have someone with a real name that you can talk to all the time. And, uh, and of course, support at Zometry is that catch-all uh, for, um, for any questions, whether it is some of the administrator getting set up on terms, uh, you know, submitting a PO um, to uh, things about a, you know, a quote or your current order. Uh, that's the great place to go. Cool. And for attending this webinar, you get to use code INSTANT50 off your next Zometry order. Um, this does expire at the end of the month, so go ahead and use what you learned today to get a quote. We also have a referral program if you don't need parts at this very moment. Um, you can always send $50 to in credits to your colleague, and then when they place their first order, you will also get $50 in credits. Those credits, those credits and those codes are applied at checkout um, on the website, but you'll see uh, like an apply credits uh, section there. But the referral program is really good, and I know um, uh, a lot of our customers use that. Uh, uh, it helps pay for prototyping. So uh, yeah, we got some questions coming in. Yep, we have some questions. Um, so we did okay. cover a couple throughout the webinar, um, but um, now we have a question from a grad student from Penn State. Um, so this person is uh, <laughs> so really close to home here. So yeah. this person is a grad student in materials, science and engineering and working on carbon fibers. So uh, they want to know you two's professional opinions on the advancements of specialty composite materials for AM. To be specific, how promising do you see the use of carbon fibers in additive manufacturing? Yeah, I think I think this is coming on strong. Um, I think there's a lot of there's both a lot of opportunity, but still a lot of work needed in this. I mean, you you do have systems that are out there, you know, Mark Forged among others, with sort of chopped fiber in there. You're seeing now also uh, sort of continuous fiber. Um, I think you know what what the opportunities there is sort of using those fibers uh, to sort of hopefully add you know, add some strength in, in sort of this direction or that direction. Certainly the continuous fiber gives you some uh, quite a bit of advantages, of course, there. If you've got the string going on, how do you stop and go to the next level and path planning uh, certainly is key to that. So I think I think as that advances, uh, you know, you're going to now move into and open up a whole new area again of the design freedom, material freedom that additive gives you where now we might we might 3D print a you know, carbon fiber reinforced part instead of just machining the uh, the heck out of a large aluminum block, right? And so I think there, when uh, we talk about buy to fly ratio in aerospace, how much material do you buy relative to the finished part? You know, and I think that the break even point there now, particularly with the increased strength and opportunities that gives you, that's gonna change dramatically over the coming years, particularly as the costs continue to come down. So so I think it's promising. Uh, if uh, If you're doing research in it, I think we need a lot of that. Uh, to really advance it and get it to the next level. So thank you, Greg. What do you what are you seeing from your perspective? I, so I've I've done layups in a previous job before for aircraft, uh, and uh, I remember Mark Forge when they were early on. Uh, and Mark Forge, they the uh, you know it's a, a 3D printing system that's pretty reliable, and it'll it'll add a um, either a Kevlar or carbon fiber kind of uh, trace um, per layer going up. 
And that's, that's, you know, that's actually, it's very good. It makes it very strong in, in certain directions. Um, but when I'm doing a layup, I'm usually contouring it. And I'm, I have a, you know, a weave of uh, either carbon fiber or, or fiberglass. And, uh, and you get that strength because you get the X, Y, and Z, and you kind of have this self-supporting nature. Think about a cup versus, you know, a, pa a plate uh, in, in that design. And uh, there's been companies that have been doing continuous uh, fiber. I know Arivo's come out uh, with some something interesting. But to your point, Tim, is it plug and play? No, it's a, it's an engineering effort. It is uh, almost like directed at energy deposition, uh, in in akin to it is not putting a support structure down a lot of times for these continuous fiber options, and it really has to be a amicable pathway to make uh, to make those designs. But once you have that third dimension in carbon fiber, you have something that's super super stiff and lightweight, and like it's it's almost shocking how strong the, this stuff behaves. You hold it and it feels like, you know, an empty egg, and then like you could drive a truck over it. Like it is, it's insanely uh, um, remarkable materials when you get the designs right. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Great. Right. And what is, what process would you recommend to get the highest resolution for small parts? Is SLA or Polyjet better for resolution on a small scale? Um, I'll handle this. I'll say uh, SLA um, is typically better on small feature resolution. And now if you look at a lot of times the design guides, they may, may be one to one. And sometimes Polyjet will actually win on like layer heights and things. Uh, but I have to water jet my Polyjet parts. Uh, there are some water soluble options, but a lot of times I'm cleaning this off uh, because Polyjet parts have a little bit of kind of a tacky film over them. That's their supporting structure. And by me cleaning that off, all of a sudden I have to, you know, touch a fine, delicate part uh, and say I have the, the lowercase i and it's a little tiny wall with a little tiny column. Uh, very easy for me to brush that away without even without even know I did it until I clean off the entire part there. So usually SLA, if uh, you can uh, naturally grow, which means I'm not uh, I'm not, you know, supporting that area, I could get a pretty a very decent detail resolution out of that. Great. And so I just want to note that while we are just a few minutes after three, we're going to get through the rest of the questions that have come in here. There's a few more. And if you have any more questions, please feel free to follow up with Greg and Tim at their emails um, on the screen here. Um, so next question, um, can you talk about Owen Hildreth's research at Mines related to sensitizing thin structures to dissolve them? I think this one's for Tim. Yeah, no, we've uh, Owen and I have uh, been collaborating on on a bit of that work for a while. I love great story there. I was you know out, uh, going around and lecturing and joking at uh, you know we've got within plastics right we have water soluble supports that you we print it out and then you throw it in a bucket overnight and it you know it dissolves away and whatnot. And I made the joke uh, when I was speaking at Arizona State when he was there and said, man, wouldn't it be great if we could do that with metals? And he came up to me afterwards and was like, I think I have an idea. So. We tried it out within uh, directed energy deposition. Uh, we basically did uh, a stainless steel part with a carbon steel support, and then you can selectively corrode away the carbon steel without uh, affecting the stainless. Essentially, corrosion as a good thing. What? You know, it's one of those things that uh, you know you, you, you got to think differently, right? And, and Owen was spot on with it. Based on what we learned there, really, the reason stainless steel is stainless, for instance, is because of the chromium that's in it. So his next crazy idea, which lo and behold worked, was let's let's basically you know heat up the part a lot, carburize it, and it draws out the chromium, uh, and it sort of sensitizes sort of the the layer. And depending on you know how much you're heating it and temperature, you can control that sensitization. You basically the depth of that. And then uh, you then basically make a stainless steel part that's not stainless around that. And uh, you do that enough and then you uh, uh, basically drop it in, uh, you know, certainly it, it's an acid bath, so you got to be careful doing it. But nonetheless, uh, you can dilute it and it will automatically dissolve that interface and your supports will drop off. Uh, he has since then a developed uh, similar for Inconel. Uh, titanium, uh, TIE 64, which is popular there as well, being able to do that. And so now with this idea, we've, you know, he's, he has basically created a way of doing dissolvable metal supports, uh, continues to work on that with mines. I think he's teamed up with uh, uh, Albert Toe at University of Pittsburgh on uh, some projects as well to how do we optimize 
support structures so that they're easy to dissolve. I think the key finding, you know, that we had was you don't you don't need to dissolve the whole support. You just got to dissolve the interface. And so how do you yeah. make sure that that works? Yep, exactly. Very cool. Uh, next question here. With DMLS, is there any work on gradient structures where different layers could have different compositions? Yeah, I think there's definitely, that's certainly, uh, we talk about functional grading or compositional grading, you know, with uh, switching materials as you build, that's certainly easier to do with DED, directed energy deposition, because it's a powder feed. You are starting to see that now within powder bed fusion. Certainly you can change your, your laser settings, for instance, from layer to layer to, to change the porosity or the microstructure. You actually, uh, Oak Ridge National Lab has done some neat work on that with uh, the RCAM system where you're using an E-beam instead of a laser. Gives you a little bit better ability to manipulate the microstructure uh, and control the thermal gradients. Uh, so you can certainly do that now, but I have also seen you're, you're starting to see uh, folks that are developing processes where you can, uh, you know, deposit a second powder, metal powder during the DMLS process in there and actually you know, changing the composition of material. Certainly it's easy to do right now with design uh, and with changing process parameter settings to, you know, create gradients in a powder bed fusion, laser powder bed fusion part. But we're going to see, I think, very soon, you know, the ability to have multiple materials in a laser powder bed fusion system that's going to be uh, is going to be game changing yet again. Is that is that Aerosend that's doing that? They're, they have some of that. Yep. They're uh, thank you. Yeah. They're they're certainly a company uh, in the U.S. Here, there's been um, I'm blanking on the name a couple of folks in the U.K. that we've seen as well. Uh, I think even Owen uh, Hildreth had some some droplet technology where he was uh, instead of a powder a droplet to be able to change that. So that's certainly a, uh, a um, you know a very open uh, research frontier, but a lot of potential there as well. And I just, uh, I know uh, I know we're running over, but the uh, um, one of the things that you have to think about the DMLS is even on those, on the regular platforms that are 10 inch by 10 inch, and there's there's larger platforms out there, there is so much money on those plates once you're done because they're completely filled with uncentered powder and then your little bit part of there. And I mean, we're talking, I need a crane to move, you know, this this amount of material through. So being able to selectively deposit like the value and then uh, have other stuff filling the area is extremely powerful. And really for any additive manufacturing process can be very powerful to just say, I'm only using what I need. Um, because exactly. every single one of these has degradation um, when it, once it's exposed out to you know, air and its environment, um, it can be recycled. But the, the lot and some of the traceability factors for de especially devices that need that uh, aerospace or medical um, it becomes a lot tougher to justify without running uh, what we call virgin material. Yeah, yeah I, when, um, just a, a quick follow-up on that. Uh, uh, my colleagues Ted Reutzel and Dalla Nasser did a quick calculation a couple of years ago just to give people a reference. So 10 inches by 10 inches by about six inches tall in order to fill that volume with, uh, with titanium powder cost you about $50,000 of titanium powder for that. So doesn't matter whether you're making one part or 10 or 15 in there, you got to put $50,000 of virgin powder in that machine to make that. So similar math on these meter by meter ones, you could easily have half a million dollars in powder sitting in that machine and using it. And so that's, you know, understanding again, the limitations and how's that going to scale to bigger parts and whether it's economical or not, I think is a key, key aspect uh, uh, to the designing for that. Yeah. Great. We have two more questions left. Second to last question here. Has there been any progress made in doping resins with graphene in the SLA world? I don't have an answer for that. I was I was looking at a question and trying to pick my brain there. And uh, I will say I in the SLA world, I haven't seen like I haven't seen that commercially available and everything Zometry's running is commercially industrial, like already standardized. Tim has some cool access and the cool stuff that I read about every day. Uh, but we're, you know, we're much more boring because we need to have repeatable, consistent results for our customers. Um, but it's usually what I've, what I've been seeing more on the commercially available resin side has been better, uh, better compounds that are exhibiting much, much stronger properties. I mean, when I think about carbon DLS, um, you are, you know, exhibiting a, you know, I have my little, you know, a very expensive hand toy here for uh, uh, made out of DLS elastomer. So this is the EPU material, but it is. Uh, but this this material can be used forever because it actually post cures as a urethane, uh, and it gets rid of essentially the photopolymers which can which can weaken over time 
or at least it replaces those with the other mechanical properties. So I've been seeing more of these kind of transformers uh, in the uh, in the SLA world where they're cured to get that shape, but then the ultimate thing that keeps that makes the part work is actually uh, post thermally activated or uh, you know a secondary process to it. Uh, that's really what I've seen most of the industry leaning right now with like what's brand new. Yeah, I think it's a it's a certainly challenging. It, it is probably going on somewhere. I know at Penn State, uh, we've got a lot of graphene research going on just in just in being able to manufacture it cheaply, effectively. Just even 2D sheets is challenging as a, in and of itself. Uh, but I think if you understand the sort of the chemistry uh, and the processing, uh, you know, you may be able to manipulate in there. I don't certainly not available in any commercial systems. Uh, but uh, definitely, I, you know, I think Jennifer Lewis, uh, I definitely track a lot of her stuff on sort of the direct writing and uh, some of the, the, the depositions and droplets and things, the work she's doing, uh, among others. So there's a lot of there's a lot of cool research going on out there. And, um, you know, if uh, if we can do that with graphene and put it in, uh, you know, in an SLA part, uh, you've got you've got a whole nother dimension of uh, a material freedom and capability there with that. Great. And last question. What do you think is the most prominent advantage that pushes designers to accept the different approaches to AM? At what point are they willing to potentially accept additional costs per item? <laughs> so I have I'll I'll take that one and then uh, and and then give you a second to think, Greg. I think uh, <laughs> I wanted to earlier. So, so there's a great quote again, Bill Brinley, uh first I heard it from Pratt and Whitney. You know, he said, we're not we're not going to fly a component, uh, a 3D printed component just because it's cool. Right. It's got to buy its way onto the engine just like anything else. And I think end of the day, you know, you may have the coolest, fanciest, you know, organic topology optimized lattice shape sort of thing. But if it's not adding value over what's currently, you know, out there, then, you know, you are going to be very hard pressed to make a business case and make money on it you know you still have to be profitable you still have to make money and i think there if you know particularly if you're trying to do a head-to-head -head comparison your your am part may, may be more expensive for your for the second half of that question but you know with consol part consolidation if i'm now eliminating you know a dozen steps to assemble if i'm eliminating weak points where i might have fluid leaks if i'm eliminating this or that you know so you you got to be in terms of making the business case you got to you got to think broader than just material cost uh, in a lot of these cases. And, and when you do that, I think you can see that AM has the potential to add a lot of value provided that you are thinking smart and, and designing your parts to take advantage of that. And I'll, I'll just add, uh, you know, so everything you said is, is absolutely true. But I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with that. I, I think what Zometry is doing best as a manufacturing marketplace is we're giving you instant access to millions of dollars of impressive additive manufacturing technology, we, and all you're doing is paying for your part. You know, you're you're just you're able to get access to you know a million dollar machine to make your part, but you're just you're just you know only only paying for that that section of it because we're able to connect so many uh, um, so many buyers with so many suppliers on our network. And I think uh, even six years ago, like before I joined Zometry, that's uh, that's was always a challenge was I may have been intimidated to get an EB like a part made of like a DMLS or you know looking at the EBM because it was just so hard to find who makes it like who does it as a service and uh, and now like it's usually a couple clicks away and uh, I think that access and lowering the barrier to entry as well as getting better economies of scale which is something that we've been uh, very proud to do at Zometry because we we have uh, some leveraging buying power because we have so many customers uh, coming through has been uh, you know, really exciting and a shift uh, in additive. I, I, even SLA, SLA itself was probably hundreds of dollars more per one off uh, just you know, five years ago than it is now. Now it's like, uh, you know, get a part 25 bucks. You know, it's, it's, it's so much uh, uh, different. Yeah. Like I, just got a, I just got a new SLA system, uh, uh, Elegoo Mars for $300 for SLA. Oh, yeah. I'm like, what? I'm in, Printed part. I mean, the machine costs are coming down. Material costs are coming down. And we've seen that in metals as well. That that they've dropped almost 40% uh, over the past uh, four or five years. So that's certainly helping. And as new technology comes on board, you know, the quad laser is now the million dollar machine, and the single laser one is now you know 250, 300k instead of millions. So it's it is changing. And 
and to your point as well, I think you know you guys are uh, you guys have been out there for a long time. Uh, I just saw Stephanie mm -hmm. Hendricks at, at Ada Manufacturing their uh, uh, service bureaus. There were what 300 or so that that they had pulled together. Just again to your point on COVID and rapid response, right? Being able to use 3D printing, I think this is a great opportunity for for additive to really shine to show you know we can get we can we're agile, we're fast, we're local. You know, being able to capitalize on those advantages, it's it's great for us. Uh, it's great for the industry, and uh, it's great to know that that additive is having such a positive impact on so many people uh, in these challenging times right now. Awesome. Thank you guys for sharing your bounty of wisdom. Special thank you to Professor Tim here for joining our webinar and giving us a whole new perspective on additive manufacturing. Um, do you have any final words before we sign off? Either of you? No, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, as Greg said, it was great to geek out with a uh, fellow uh, additive and 3D printing fanatic here. I've, I've always enjoyed your talks as well. Uh, I will put a put a final plug, if you don't mind, on our uh, you know our additive manufacturing and design graduate program is uh, both online and resident. I'm still trying to twist Greg's arm to enroll in that, but uh, it's close. So, close. It's so close. So it's, it, uh, unfortunately, I'm hearing so many training budgets are being just killed right now, along with travel and whatnot. But uh, but nonetheless, there are some great there are some great learning opportunities out there. I've appreciated all the webinars that companies have been doing certainly for my class uh, as I'm teaching students, but uh, from an education and, uh, and workforce development perspective. So thanks for the opportunity. And thanks also for all the great resources that, uh, that you guys have been sharing free of charge uh, online. It's certainly, uh, you know, uh, uh, the rising tide lifts all boats as they say here. So I think uh, every little bit helps. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tim. Thanks for being on. And uh, yeah, I think that's a great way to close this. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, thank everyone, you. and have a great day. All right. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Have a great day.